Good morning, CFLM. This is Floyd, one of your shepherds. And before we get started this morning, I'd like to make a few announcements. First of all, just because we aren't meeting doesn't mean you can't send in prayer requests. So if you have a prayer request, you can send those to ChristFellowship5 at gmail.com. Once again, that's ChristFellowship5 at gmail.com. Also, some have been wondering how you can give since we aren't meeting physically. You can give in a few different ways. The easiest way to give is to go to CFLM.org and click on the giving link. You can also use your bank's bill pay to send a check in or you can send a check in yourself by sending it to Christ Fellowship, P.O. Box 387, Mainville, Ohio 45039. You can also find this address on our website under the giving link. And coming up this week, the women's group and the men's group will have Zoom meetings where they'll be doing Bible studies. Details about both these will be in the upcoming newsletter. So now, let's get to worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning, CFLM. It's so good to think that you're here with us today. And uh, I know it's just a strange way of doing worship, and we say this every week, but when we're looking out here with, to empty chairs, <laughs> in my mind, I'm picturing you guys. Um, I hope that you are worshiping with us, that you are singing, um, singing out loud, standing up, and, and celebrating the Lord. Um, so this week, um, I know a lot of people have been talking about the stress, and one thing that I do is when I work out my stress, it appears in my dreams. So for example, for music, when I'm stressing about something for music, I dream about not being able to read music or not even knowing the songs that everybody else is playing. You know, Those are my dreams when I'm stressed about music. But at home, when I'm stressed, I dream about like laundry piling up around me. Anybody, anybody, just me. So what was really funny is last night I had a dream. I went to Kroger <laughs> and I went into the paper products aisle and there was a package, a large package of toilet paper. <laughs> and I'm like lifting it up, I'm like, yeah, I got toilet paper. So it's the funny things how your brain processes, how we process things. The most interesting element that I have um, found myself doing though is being very thankful for the basic things. You know, we taught our kids early on that when we're praying for before a meal, you know, they're always, thank you for this food, thank you for the, and I will tell you that my heart is like, Lord, thank you for this food. I mean, really, thank you for it. Um, it's not a normal, natural, automatic thing that we have on our tables right now. There's a lot of fear and worry and I'm thankful that we have the basic needs met. Um, so for a moment, I'd like for you in your family circle to go around and I want you to talk about something that you are thankful for. Okay, you got 30 seconds, so go. I am personally thankful for all of the people on this platform who get to sing with me, not get to sing with me, who sing along with me and play along with me. These guys are dedicated. Um, a lot of them are not even on the screen that you can see, but um, they are here, they're working on their music, um, they're pushing through so that you, CFLM, can worship from where you are. So if you have a moment this week, I encourage you to encourage them. Um, they're working really hard and um, just love to sing to the Lord. So I, I hope that you give them a word of encouragement. All right, so welcome. We're going to start with Matthew. Matthew says this, Anyone who listens to my teachings and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. If you are feeling 
that the winds of insecurity are pressing against you, the financial strain is pouring upon you in torrents, if you are worried about your family's health and it feels like a flood is rising and you are drowning in it, listen to this. Those who put their hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can know, you can know that God has you in his hands. He is a firm foundation and our faith is built on him. Amen? Amen, sing it loud. Let's sing it out to him. Thank you. 
surrender daily to Jesus, we begin to see him building what only, what only he can build in us. That's right. What is he building in you, church? What is the work he is doing in your life today? And through this unusual time, don't waste what he is trying to show you. What is the work he is doing in our life today and through this unusual time? Don't waste what he's trying to show you. Trust that his work is a good work and that he will work. Oh, he's going to work all things, all things together for his good. His is a love. It cannot be moved. In Jesus, we are given a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Amen. Hebrews 12, 28 says, let us be thankful then because we, we church, we receive a kingdom. Oh, it cannot be shaken. Amen. Amen. Let us be grateful and worship God in a way that will please him and reverence and awe. Oh.
Well, you'll notice that I'm coming to you from a different place this morning. It's my office at home. Circumstances made it wisest not to take this message at the church building this week. So you're getting this uh, hopefully more intimate setting that'll still allow us to connect. I want you to know how much I miss being able to, uh, to be with you in person. I'm thankful for the virtual ways that we can still engage with each other, but it's not the same. But there's no less love, no less interest in what's going on in your lives. And no less desire to share something with you to help you through another week. It seems like every day there's something new to weigh down our hearts. But I want you to know you're not alone having to navigate all that's coming your way. We have each other and we have God. Well, in the middle of all the distraction we're experiencing now in the world, as we begin this week leading into Easter, it's going to be very different celebrating this year for certain. But it begs us to remember what it means in a fullest way. There are several key days that are often traditionally observed during the, this week in the church calendar. For instance, today is Palm Sunday when we remember Jesus' triumphal march into Jerusalem, riding on the back of that donkey with crowds waving palm branches and shouting hosannas along the way. Then there's what sometimes is called Monday Thursday. 
It's one of those words in there that sounds a little foreign to us because Mondi comes from a Latin word that meant commandment. It was during Thursday night's celebration of the Passover meal and the institution of the Lord's Supper that Jesus had said to his disciples, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. Next follows Good Friday, the, the day of Christ's crucifixion. It's, its description as good is probably because of the historic use of the word good to mean holy. It's a solemn, sacred day. And then there's Easter Sunday, that grand, glorious climax to it all, Resurrection Day, when we pull out all the stops, the grand keynote of all the gospel message, when we say to each other, he's risen. But there is yet another day, celebrated by some, though passed over by many. It's sometimes called Holy Saturday. And I suspect some of you may have never even heard of it before. And there's actually very little we know about this Saturday other than that it was just the day after the crucifixion Friday and the day after the resurrection Sunday. We know that the tomb was sealed and guarded through that day, but a little more. Saturday was the day in between, a painfully silent day. I'm struck by how John Ortberg describes this holy Saturday. He says it was the day after this, but the day before that. The day after a prayer gets prayed, but before it gets answered. The day after a soul gets crushed way down, but before it gets at all lifted up. It is this kind of strange day, this Saturday. It is the in-between day. Not Friday, not Sunday, in between despair and joy, in between confusion and blinding clarity, in between bad news and good news, in between darkness and light, in between hate and love, in between death and life. On Good Friday, our, our sins get paid for. On Easter Sunday, our hope is brought to life. Saturday is that day with, with no name, the day when nothing happened. Saturday is the day your dream died. You wake up and you're still alive and you must go on, but you don't know how and worst, you don't know why. And it all brings up this odd question, this, this strange story. Why is there a Saturday? It doesn't further the storyline. If Jesus is going to be crucified and then resurrected, why not get on with it? Just, just die on the cross and then boom, resurrection. Why is it just those two events, but over three days. There's a reason for Saturday. The, the story of Easter isn't a two-day story. It's a third-day story. But the trouble with a third-day story is you don't know it's a third-day story when you're in the middle of it. Nobody saw Sunday coming. God is even uncomfortably silent on Saturday. I like the way Max Lucato describes it. He says, God made himself heard on Friday, but nothing on Saturday. Jesus is silent. God is silent. Saturday is silent. But not only was Saturday silent, I would call it dark. You might know that the Jewish day didn't begin with the morning, with the dawn, but with the coming of the evening, with the onset of darkness. So it's interesting to listen to how Matthew begins to describe almost an earlier than usual darkening of Friday as he paints this scene as it leads us in to Easter's Saturday. At noon, he says, darkness fell across the whole land. And about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then Jesus shouted out again, and he released his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two. The earth shook, and rocks split apart, and tombs opened. As evening approached, Joseph, uh, a rich man from Arimathea who had become a follower of Jesus, went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate issued an order to release it to him. Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a long sheet, a long, clean linen cloth. 
he placed it in his own tomb, which had been carved out of the rock. Then he rolled a great stone across the entrance and left. Both Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting across from the tomb and watching. Luke's gospel adds this further note regarding these two women. It says, Then they went home and prepared spices and ointments to anoint his body, but by the time they were finished, the Sabbath had begun, so they rested as required by the law. Jesus actually had a number of women who also followed him as disciples, and the gospel records that some of them actually helped provide funds for his ministry. They were, you might call them his, his patrons. Mary Magdalene was among them, and her gratitude was surely generated by the fact that Jesus had liberated her from seven demons that had possessed her soul. Jesus was her deliverer. And then there was this other Mary, waiting at Jesus' tomb with Mary Magdalene. Perhaps this Mary was the mother of one of the disciples of Christ, James the last, the younger James, not the brother of John, we're not sure. And we know little more about either of them, but that Jesus had impacted their lives so profoundly that even at great personal risk, they'd volunteered to help prepare his body for burial. That they sat in the sinking shadows of that day and then waited through the further agony of that long Saturday Sabbath that followed. I wonder how they felt, what they thought, how how dark that whole day must have been for them. And now left to endure the aftermath of dashed hopes and uncertain tomorrows. They they'd probably heard Jesus make predictions about his death, even allusions to a promised return, even a resurrection, but they'd watched him die and they'd seen the gruesome wounds and they had been witnesses to his broken body finally laid in that stone cold tomb. He was dead. Now, there's a temptation to rush from Good Friday straight to Easter Sunday for lots of good reasons. No one wants to live in a cemetery. No one wants to wallow in sadness. But in real life, Fridays don't often rush into Sundays. More times than not, they are hard, even desperately long Saturdays. Saturdays that don't even offer the absolute assurances that Sundays will ever come. And isn't there something in most of us that would like to skip through the darkness and into the light to avoid the darkness of Saturdays and just live only in the bright sunshine of Sundays? The truth is, though, that much of your life and mine can often be Saturday life. Hope giving way to disappointments, prayers seeming to be unanswered, brokenness without a certain sense that healing will come. You may want to skip Saturdays, but you find yourself standing by graves and sitting in intensive care rooms and appearing in divorce courts, hearing doctors say, I'm sorry, but you have a very terminal form of cancer. You lose jobs. You watch your retirement savings vanish. You, you wonder whether the person whom you pass in the store might infect you with some potentially deadly virus. We all love Easter Sundays filled with trumpet sounds and lilies and resurrection songs, but what about Saturdays? I'm struck by what John Ortberg had to say about Easter not being a two-day story, but a third-day story, about why not just the cross and then boom, the resurrection. And I wonder, is there something about Saturdays that are not necessarily and perhaps even more valuable for us by not having them excluded from our life calendars. There's a remarkable book that uh, I worked my way through in part of preparation for today's thoughts. It's Barbara Taylor Brown's Learning to Walk in the Dark. And in her book, she expresses this amazing thought. She writes, I have learned things in the dark that I would never have learned in the light. Things that have saved my life over and over again so that there is really only one logical conclusion. I need darkness as much as I need light. Brown uh, begins her book with the keen memory of her mother's voice. 
Come inside now, it's getting dark, her mother would say, every evening as she looked out the kitchen window to see the sun going down. It didn't matter whether the window was in Kansas, Ohio, Alabama, or Georgia. Dark was dark, and she wanted her children inside. She loved us enough, Barbara says, to call us inside so that nothing bad would happen to us in the dark. There's a certain dangerousness to the dark that we all learn to feel, a longing to be somewhere safe, out of the shadows, where doors are securely locked and there's plenty of lights on. Brown remembers what it was like when her parents would put her to bed at night. She would get kisses and good nights, and then the lights would go off, and once her parents' presence had firmly faded away, in her words, all the loose darkness in that room started to collect in the closet and under the bed. Honestly, you don't have to read There's a Monster Under My Bed to know that there is one. One time my two youngest children wanted to sleep in the same room together, but they uh, they played and made noise, too much noise, for far too long, until finally I had to come in and say, you've got to turn this light off and go to sleep. And about then, I looked at our youngest, who for some reason had a certain flash of terror. He was just a little guy, and he said, but Daddy... If you turn that light off, it's going to be very dark in here. We're all children who long to have night lights plugged into every receptacle of our dark hallways, who cry out, Mommy and Daddy, in the middle of cold black nights. Darkness scares us. It makes us feel vulnerable and all alone. There may be times in our lives where we might even ask, Where is God? We're in good company with these words because Jesus himself cried out something similar from the cross when he said, Why have you forsaken me, God? Why is this moment so incredibly dark and do I feel so frighteningly alone? We want, and perhaps Jesus even wished, to rush into Easter to bypass the darkness just quickly to get into the light. But if we're being truthful, that's it's not what a whole lot of life is like for us. There is darkness, despite our strongest efforts to avoid it, deny it, or even try to rush past it. There is darkness. Barbara Taylor Brown says that darkness is shorthand for anything that scares me, that I want no part of, either because I'm sure I don't have the resources to survive it or because I don't want to find out. Somebody needs to leave the lights on. Have you ever been deep down in a cave, so deep, so far away from the light, you can't even see your hand up and in front of your face? Black, impenetrable darkness. When I was a kid, our, our family went on a memorable tour of Mammoth Cave down in Kentucky. And I'll never forget one moment in that tour. We were about halfway through, and we'd been following these long, winding passages, sometimes narrow, sometimes vast, for quite some time. But they'd always been pretty well lit until this moment when the ranger standing next to an electrical switch warned us he made the announcement that he was going to turn out all of the lights. Now my early grade school heart skipped a few beats. But I also had my dad's strong hand nearby so I didn't grow too alarmed. But when the switch was flipped and the darkness enveloped me I didn't cry. But I also wasn't fully calm dad's hand or not. I've heard a story told about this moment that, that in one of those tours when a little brother or sister did begin to cry, they only had one of their sister, sister siblings who popped up to say, don't worry, somebody here knows how to turn on the lights. But what about when the way gets dark and no one seems to have a hand on any switch? C.S. Lewis was a giant of a man when he came to faith, but when his wife died of cancer, it almost destroyed him in about every way. They hadn't been married long, and he had been a confirmed bachelor all of his life, and her love had opened up something inside of him that he never knew he could experience. But now she was gone, and in his grief, he got out a journal and began to write hard, honest, struggling, even harsh truths about everything that was impacting him in this grief, and it was in one of the especially dark moments that he wrote these words. Where is God? This is one of the most disquieting symptoms 
when you're happy, so happy that you have no sense of needing him, so happy that you're tempted to feel his claims upon you as an interruption, if you remember yourself and turn to him with gratitude and praise, you will be, or so it feels, welcomed with open arms. But go to him when your need is desperate, when, when all other help is vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face and a sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. And after that, silence. You may as well turn away. The, the longer you wait, the more emphatic the silence will become. There are no lights in the windows. It might be an empty house. Was it ever inhabited? It seems so once. Why is he so present a commander in our time of prosperity and so absent a help in time of, of trouble? Now, you need to know that Lewis didn't stay forever stuck in that dark Saturday, but neither did he find a way out of it very quickly. His grief and his darkness and his feelings of being abandoned, unheard, unhelped were raw and real, and even his expressed doubts had a place. Now, he emerged a stronger man, but he wasn't able to skip quickly from Friday to Sunday. It was a very long Saturday in between. What if dark Saturdays aren't to be avoided? What if something vital is to be learned about ourselves and about God when all the lights go out? Barbara Taylor Brown laments that she thinks too many churches are preoccupied with keeping the lights on right now, that the last thing they want to talk about is how to befriend, uh, befriend the dark. Dark to them is only seen as evil to be avoided. It's always about Sunday, shiny faith, never about Saturday darkness. Brown suggests that a lot of times what churches have is what she describes as a full solar orientation. That is, there is night, which is bad, and there is day, which is good. And so we should spend all of our life in the day. But while there is a lot of light in life, there's also a lot of darkness, and that darkness is often unpredictable and unavoidable. So Brown creatively suggests that rather than a solar orientation where we're all fixated on the sun, we ought to consider adopting a lunar spirituality. At acknowledgement, she says that life is more like the phases of the moon rather than the clear light and then the dark of a day, sun on sun off, that there are nights, she says, when the moon is as round and bright as a headlight, yet other nights it is thinner than the sickle hanging in her garage. Some nights it is high in the sky and other nights low over the mountains. Some nights it's altogether gone, leaving a vast web of stars that are brighter in its absence. All in all, she suggests, the moon is a truer mirror for my soul than the sun that looks the same way every day. What if our spiritual life is often more like the waxing and the waning of the moon than the bright and the predictable rising of a full sun? What if life is often fuller of dark Saturdays more than it is even Easter Sundays? Now, Brown's not arguing for an abandonment of faith, but for just a more honest embrace of how faith has ebbs and flows, like a tide that comes in and a tide that unfortunately sometimes goes back out. And perhaps, just perhaps, God allows the dark to be our teacher as well as the light, that Saturdays are, are not necessarily just crazy painful anomalies, but just an essential part of life. Why didn't God just bring Jesus back to life in a split second after he died? Wouldn't that have been a more gracious thing uh, to do both for Christ and all the disciples that were sitting around the cross and had to see him die? Wouldn't it have been the best and most emphatic way to teach those who had put him to death that they didn't get the last word? Without that last word of new life immediately being spoken, they had to wait through a Saturday. Why do these two Marys have to follow Jesus to a cold grave and see his body wrapped up in a burial shroud and locked up in a dark tomb? Why do they have to go home, unable because of the dark, to prepare Jesus' body with spices as was the burial custom of the day? 
Not only did they have to watch him die, they couldn't even help him get a proper burial. Why did it have to be Saturday, the Sabbath? Why did it require them to stop, to rest, to live through the agony of another day when his body was beginning to rot away? Why didn't it just jump straight into Easter's sunny Sunday? Brown's book is too full of intriguing thoughts to relate them all in a short time, but suffice it to say that she she decided to explore and to embrace and to welcome darkness. Uh, she hired some guides to help her check out deep caves. She laid out on an air mattress in her backyard to take in the full fullness of the night sky. She had a blind person help her find ways to experience what it was like to go about all of life in the dark. The bottom line is the title of her book proclaims she tried to learn how to walk in the dark. And what she found out was that the dark night of the soul can be a frightening thing, but also a spirit-developing experience. And as she looked into scripture, she found evidence that the same had been the experience of others in ancient times too. She read how a Cappadocian monk named Gregory of Nyssa saw as a cipher the experience of Moses who wild whose wilderness vision of God at Mount Sinai went something like this. It began with light, but then afterwards God spoke to him in a cloud. But when Moses rose higher and became more perfect, he saw God in the darkness. Gregory suggested that in the same way, those of us who wish to draw near to God should not be surprised when our vision goes cloudy, for this is a sign that we're approaching the opaque splendor of God. Eventually, arrival at the pinnacle of the spiritual journey towards God, which exists in complete and dazzling darkness. What if we find God, not only in the light, but also, sometimes perhaps even more deeply, within the darkness? Where have some of your most powerful life lessons been taught to you on bright Sundays or during dark Saturdays? Three days even have parallels in the past, like Jonah's three days in the belly of a big fish. No schoolroom in Jonah's life was surely any darker or more effective when his third day came and he got spit out. He was a spiritually corrected Jonah who'd come to realize that when God said go to Nineveh, he needed to obey. Jonah's best lesson was learned in the dark belly of that big fish. Saturday can be days of holy purpose if we let them. One of the lies that, we, lies that we've come to believe is that God is only present in light. That we can only find the assurance of his presence when the sun is in its full display. And so we do everything we can to avoid darkness, trying to... Uh, tear Sundays out of our calendars, assuming that God could never be there. There's a favorite psalm that many of us memorized when we were children that includes these words. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Or Psalm 139, we find these words that powerfully also speak to us. The psalmist says, I can never escape from your spirit. I can, I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I, if I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as the day. Darkness and light are the same to you. Or Barbara Taylor Brown casts light and dark in this way. She says, it's a helpful reminder to all who fear the dark. Darkness does not come from a different place than light. It does, it's not presided over by a different God. While it was still dark in the early morning of Easter, it points us towards the God for whom darkness and light are alike. Both are fertile seasons for those who walk by faith and not by sight. This darkness is necessary to new life, even when it's uncomfortable or we feel it goes on too long. Next spring's seeds break open 
out of the dark winter soil. God's Spirit hovers over dark waters of chaos, preparing to create something new. God tells Abraham to look up into the stars of the night sky. Jacob wrestles with an angel at night, followed by securing a blessing. In these words, surely God was in this place, and, and I didn't know it. Nicodemus comes to Jesus under the cover of night and begins his inward spiritual journey. In the nativity story, the, the angel appears to Joseph in a dream at night, and shepherds look up into the night sky that's exploding with angels singing glory to God, and the magi follow a star through the night, and God gives birth to the incarnation of Christ as he forms him in the deep darkness of the womb. And even in the dark, cold, damp, airless tomb, God was preparing the body of Jesus to come back to life again. Holy Saturday was the dark prelude for Easter's light. Perhaps one of the greatest testimonies of faith is to embrace the darkness. Brown writes that one of the hardest things to decide during a dark night is whether to surrender or to resist. The choice often comes down to what you believe about God and how God acts, she says, which means that every night, every dark night of the world, involves wrestling with belief. There's a popular Christian song by Lauren Daigle called Trust in You, and it's got a really interesting refrain. She sings, When you don't move mountains, I'm needing you more. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. So what are we supposed to, to make of Holy Saturday, or even as importantly, what are we supposed to make of this unprecedented moment in which we now find ourselves in human history? It, at least in my lifetime, there's never been anything that I've experienced that has so shaken the world in a collective way. Now, I didn't live through, obviously, the two great wars of the 20th century, and perhaps there are equivalencies to how that shook the whole globe. But this coronavirus pandemic has captured our world's attention in dramatic fashion. But perhaps it will also capture and even change our souls. One last quote from Brown. While the dark night of the soul is usually understood to descend on one person at a time, she says there are clearly times when whole communities of people lose sight of the sun in ways that unnerve them. Hmm, what is there that we might learn in this present darkness? What is it that God, through this dark Saturday, might teach us? Might we also come to learn? Might we also come to say that we have learned things in the dark that we can never learn in the light? The bright light and the hallelujahs of Easter will come after this weekend's, but not before we have welcomed and we have waited through Holy Saturday. You see, life is not all light. We all could live better and more fully by learning to walk in the dark. Let's pray. God, I am thankful for how you teach us through your word, about how you teach us through life, about the easy lessons and the hard lessons. And I pray as we focused on this sometimes very frustrating and hard in-between time that we will have learned something about you and about us, about how you are always there if we believe, and how you want to teach us, not just in the sunlight, but in the darkness. We give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks for this week. And as we anticipate Easter to come, we give thanks for the hope that we have in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. On the night before he died, Jesus gathered his disciples in an upper room in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover and to institute a meal that we're about to take just now together. Later on that long night of his soul, he spoke encouragement into the hearts of his disciples. And in John 16, 33, we find these words recorded. Take heart. 
I have overcome the world. As we share the bread in the cup right now, we, we do it not in the same room, but with the same heart as we come together. And we find strength in communion with each other and in communion with God and with these words that take heart. God will get us through. We trust in him. Let's pray and then let's share this meal. God, for the promise that you've given us through Christ, that things in life can be overcome because of his power and his strength, we give you thanks. And now as we share this meal, we pray that you will remind us of the relationship, the confident relationship that we can have with you. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you.